Today, I will be talking about identifying victim remains using kinship genotype inference. In 2008, a bus was traveling towards the coast near the city of Quimataport, South Africa. As the bus was traveling down the road, the front left tire exploded and the bus crashed and caught fire. There were about 50-some passengers on board, and many of them escaped. Still, there were 17 fatalities. And when the police came to recover the victim remains, they saw that 15 of these victims, their bodies were burned beyond recognition. There was no way to physically identify them. And there were no dental records, so there was no way that they would be able to identify these victim remains. So the police solicited the community to provide DNA samples. They asked people that if they thought that one of their relatives were on the bus to provide a DNA sample. So the police asked the lab to take DNA from the victim remains and take these family reference samples and to somehow use them to be able to associate the victim remains with the families. However, the lab wasn't able to identify any of these 15 victims. So here is a list of those 15 victim remains. The lab had sampled the, the, the victims' bodies and produced DNA references from them. They had used the SGM Plus kit, and so there were 10 STRs, and the data was very clean. The lab also received 16 samples from family members who thought one of their family members was one of the 15 victims on this bus crash. So here we have that list of those references. And then if you look at the column on the right, you see how this person was associated with the, the missing person on the bus. So we have grandfather, daughter, son, mother, and, and, and so on. So the task is to identify the victim remains using the family references. Now again, the lab wasn't able to uh, do anything with this information. However, the South African police at that time were speaking to cyber genetics about some casework and they also knew that we had worked on the World Trade Center disaster where we used the true little computer to identify the re victim remains there using uh, kinship information and also personal effects and putting all that information together to identify victims. So here we see a pedigree. And if you look in the middle, you can see that there is that grade box. That is the missing person. And in whether it was with the World Trade Center or in this bus crash, the task is to identify that person, that missing person's genetic type or genotype. And when I use the word genotype, I mean allele pair possibilities with probability. Now, for single source like references like we have here with the victim remains and the family members. There's only one allele, uh, there's only a one allele pair possibility and it has a 100% probability at uh, each locus. However, with a kinship genotype or a genotype inferred from a mixture sample that there may be more allele pair possibilities uh, with varying probabilities. However, when I use the word genotype, that's what I'm referring to. So here, we're trying to construct that missing person's genotype from family information. So we can have parents, we can have children, uh, we can use a spouse to uh, subtract out like the children's DNA, uh, we can use siblings, and the more information we have, the more certain or the less uncertainty we can have in that missing person's genotype. And again, in the World Trade Center, there were many more uh, family members. But here, with this bus crash, we only have one family member. So here is a Punnett square here on the left. So we let's just say we have parents, 
And using a Punnett square, we can easily infer the children's genotypes up to probability. That, that would make sense. That seems like that would be somewhat easy to do. But if we look on the right, what do we do if we have a child? How easy is it to infer parents or grandparents or grandchildren or siblings? Now, I, I've looked over some papers, and I know that um, there are some ways. However, it is not an easy thing to do, especially in 2008. So I understand how the crime lab wasn't able to get any results in this case, because it is a hard task to perform. However, I have the Trulo computer, and because it automates the task, it's actually pretty easy to do. So the first thing it does, it's going to take those, those sequencer files and infer the genotypes for the victim references and also for the family members. And then just by giving it the kinship information, like if it's a grandfather, grandchild, parent, sibling, uh, however, whatever, it's going to use that information and the family references to infer the kinship genotypes. There's nothing I have to do. And it uses a database so that as I put the victim remains in one grouping on the database and the kinship genotypes in another grouping, it will automatically make the comparisons. So I don't have to do any searching of the database. I just need to ask it, well, what did you find? And then lastly, as many PG softwares, is it will calculate the association, the strength of match. So it will calculate the likelihood ratio for these associations between the victim remains and the uh, kinship genotypes. And we can use whatever population that, that's relevant, like we could use the South African population here. So let's focus in on one of those comparisons. If we look over to the right, the computer's going to start with the mother's genotype. And using the, the kinship information, it's going to infer the genotype of the missing child. As you can see that the father's genotype is grayed out because the computer does not have access to that. It's just using the mother's genotype to infer this child. And then once it did that, it then compared this kinship genotype with all of the victim remains. And it did this automatically. And so what we see here is that the computer statistically associates this missing child's genotype with one of the victim remains. And we can see the strength of that association inside that orange arrow. That value of 3.36 is the log of the likelihood ratio, where uh, as I would say in court, it's the number of zeros. So a three is a thousand, a six would be a million, and so on. So the computer automatically inferred the kinship genotypes, compared them with all the victim remains, and provided a statistical association. All automatically. It did this for this family member, and also for all the other family members as well. This table shows all of our results. So if you look at the left column, that is that list of the victim remains. And if we look across the top, those are the family members who has provided their DNA samples. And those values that if we look at any row and column, those values are the statistical association between this family and that victim remains. So we have some numbers of in the tens, hundreds, thousands, and hundreds of thousands. And I know that in the days of octillions and nonillions that these values may look low. However, when you have 10 loci, these are all uh, significant. So the com true little computer associated nine of these victim remains with family members. And, but what about the other six? And we thought about that, and there are some possibilities. One possibility is that uh, the family did not have a victim on the bus. Another possibility is that the 
relationship that was given to the police was actually not a biological relationship. So that if a child was given to a, a family at an early age, uh, th- that child may uh, see that those people are his parents or her parents or those parents see that as their child. However, there's no actual biological relationship. So this may be another reason why there is no statistical association for all 15 victim remains. So this is that same information just shown graphically where I've drawn a line between the family and the victim remains. And this is showed that you also can see the biological relationship of the family with the victim remains. I'd like to focus in on one of those relationships because if you look, it's the, the one I have circled there. It's the relationship's actually unknown. And that's how we received it. And we asked the police if they knew, and they also did not know what the biological or what the relationship was. It was not given. So without the relationship, I just assumed parents, children, and siblings. And you can see that there's a line between that family and a victim remains. So even without knowing the exact relationship, the computer was still able to make an association. And after seeing that, I actually went back and and ran all of these with just, again, all possible parents, children, and, and siblings, and was able to get the same information. That was 2008 and 2009. But this is 2023. And things have changed. As I said before, we used to look at statistics in the thousands and millions, and now it's octillions and non-millions and larger. There's new kits. There's new DNA technologies. The true little software has gotten much, much more powerful. However, some things haven't changed. There's still bus crashes. There's still mass disasters with earthquakes and tsunamis and other man-made disasters where the task is still the same, where we want to identify the missing people from relatives. Again, trying to identify uh, the victim remains. So here we are again. And Dr. Perlin and I were traveling overseas and there was a bridge collapse in the in the, in the country we were in, and we were just thinking, okay, here it is again, where the police are going to have to recover victim remains and try to give these victims back to their, their families. So how easy is it to do? And that was the question we wanted to answer. So we decided to, in our workshop, to test that out. So for this exercise, we had a true little server on the cloud. It had 12 interpretation processors, which just means it could do 12 things at once. There were 20 students in attendance. And when I say students, I mean these were forensic analysts or the directors of labs. And people have had some uh, exposure to forensics. However, they may not have had any exposure to probabilistic genotyping software. And the task was to be able to to get each student to solve this bus crash disaster, to be able to associate the victim remains with the families. So the first task in this exercise was to get the students to use the true little computer to infer the victim remains and family members' genotypes. And to do that, they loaded the sequencer files into the computer. The computer tracks the size standards, does some quality checks. They upload it to the cloud, and then the computer infers the genotypes automatically. Then, to provide the kinship information, they just had to upload a file to the true little cloud server. And then the computer, over lunch, was going to infer all the victim genotypes, infer the family member genotypes, infer the kinship genotypes from the family member genotypes, and then do all the comparisons. With 20 students, it had to do 4,800 total comparisons. And it's doing this all over lunch. So once the students had finished their lunch and sat back down at their computers, they just asked the computer, well, what did you find? and they were able to make the identifications 
of the victim remains like we did back in 2008. And so what we saw from that was that with very little training, because the students had only had the software maybe for a couple hours that week, and this day only took a couple hours. So anyone could solve this problem. In conclusion, we showed that Trulil was able to identify the victim remains in this bus crash using kinship genotype inference and inferred those kinship genotypes from the family members and automatically compared those with the victim remains, all using an automated uh, database. It gave a number for this association. So it's informative. It, it gave the log of the likelihood ratio so we could see statistically how these genotypes are associated. And as our student exercise showed, this is very easy to use. And I just want to end with, if there's a need, we're here to help. Thank you.